this guy's garage. Like and subscribe. Thank you very much for inviting me to share some views about whether and how social media can undermine privacy, safety, security, and democracy. I am Sharon Polsky, President of the Privacy and Access Council of Canada, an independent, non-profit, non-partisan organization that is not funded by government or industry. One of the, the big challenges I think that we face is, is when somebody downloads an app, they click a check mark of terms and conditions, um, and there's education uh, increasingly about what should or shouldn't be posted on social media, but there's this kind of gray world out there as to what information is actually being harvested, accessed, location, and otherwise. In fact, it was this committee that looked into uh, the fact that cell phone uh, location information was shared with the government during the COVID-19 pandemic, which which detailed, you know, people's trips to liquor stores and grocery stores and other public places. So uh, to, to our witness, I, um, how do we reconcile this, this now big data world where somebody will download an app, check a box, and all of a sudden their information goes to uh, uh, something that, that we don't really understand where or the impacts of where that data is going? Sure, good question, especially... Uh, considering that previous witnesses in this committee uh, from CSE and CSIS said repeatedly that it is up to the consumer, including children, to read the privacy policy and understand what is going on. A lot of my colleagues and members of the, committee of the uh, Privacy and Access Council of Canada, they don't get it. They don't understand it. How can we reasonably expect children or anybody else to? I live this stuff. Most people don't. Um, how does it happen? Because largely it's foreign companies. Our laws are obsolete, ineffective, poorly enforced. They do it because they can. And are we seeing these, the gaps that you're highlighting being, can you point to examples in Canada where that's being leveraged for foreign state actors, for um, uh, uh, other entities that would try to do Canadians harm? Can you point to examples and say that's, that's where, where we're seeing the consequences of this being played out in real time? I think it is pervasive. I also, uh, in the last half hour, it took me a few minutes to find the birthdays of all but three members of this committee. And to you, an advance, happy birthday next week. <laughs> yes. oh, th it's thank very you for easy. That. Yeah. Yeah. Our information is out there. And even if we put bogus information, mm -hmm. I mean, you can imagine what my children went through. And they have their online birthdays. And on their real birthdays, their friends say, happy birthday. The algorithms pick up on that, the algorithms detect. Uh, by the, the volume of greetings on the real date, that that's the real birthday. And the other information that is amassed through this hidden data broker system where our, our information is traded and sold and bid on instantly, the minutia of our lives are available globally for sale. I appreciate that, and thanks for the birthday wishes. And I'm I'm certainly much younger than I look, so that's. Uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> thanks, chair. Uh, so, so we see, you know, the the uh, the thing that triggered this study um, was largely the the issue of TikTok and the government banning that on on mobile devices, government mobile devices. We saw just uh, uh, a number of weeks ago the government banned WeChat, which has certainly far more closely connected, uh, 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 dir direct connections rather, with the, the communist dictatorship in Beijing. So, so I guess my, my question is, those are two examples that have made headlines that the government has taken action on, but we saw the weather app or a weather app be be one of the the uh, uh, apps that was selling data that led to um, the government that the government purchased over the course of the COVID nineteen pandemic. So so I guess more generally, can you provide your insight to the committee in about a minute, if you can, about how we look at this perspective in the big picture to look beyond just TikTok or 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 WeChat or social media, but the the 
the access that we are giving to uh, uh, entities that has an incredible amount of information. I agree. It's not just a matter of one social media platform or another or one company or one government or another. This is pervasive and it's been growing for a generation. Um, what do we do about it and how do we stop it? Yes, education f starting at the very youngest ages. Uh, is it too late to put the genie back in the bottle? No. <sighs> There is so much information about each of us floating out there that we don't even realize that we individually are at a loss. Corporately, people who are the procurement officers who know as much or as little as most people are at the mercy of the vendors. Who's n they're not interested in your privacy or yours. They're interested in their commission and their bottom line and their, their shareholders benefiting. Thank you, and I certainly appreciate your... I think quite right uh, analysis of, of, of the uh, consumer as the commodity. I think that is absolutely what underscores most of what we're talking about here. And, and if I'm correct, were you here for the previous panel in terms of my, my lines of questioning? You, you would note that I brought up quite um, frequently the notion that there isn't one boogeyman in this scenario, but in fact, all platforms are engaged in this type of surveillance capitalism. And whether or not a, a, a foreign state actor th visa ByteDance has direct access or another dictatorial regime purchases it uh, you know, as the highest bidder from another, fundamentally there isn't really a difference. They have the data. Would you agree with that analysis? Absolutely, because our information is being sold and traded and bid in real time. And we don't know it, and we can't say, no, don't do that, because we have no idea who is bidding on our information. We don't have a direct relationship with them. We have no recourse. We, our information is gone. And, and on that, I want to talk about the recourse. You had mentioned about the teeth that you'd like to see in legislation. With specificity, could you just take a moment and just reflect on the types of teeth that you would like to see in, in a proposed um, legislation that would deal with privacy in a more fulsome way? I can give you a very quick example. Um, the same way that companies now are fined, but not the individuals, it's meaningless. By contrast, uh, after the Enron scandal what, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, the United States passed the SOX legislation, Sarbanes-Oxley Financial Accountability Act, I think is the complete name. And that said, very simply, the person at the head of the organization is responsible for everything in the financial statement. If things go sideways, they personally face multi-million dollar fines and jail time. Companies around the world, including Canada, scrambled to make sure they were SOX compliant. We need the same thing. And so is it your assertion that by not granting kind of full information and full consent when somebody engages in an app or a platform, that that is a type of fraud committed by, by the company um, and therefore should have a criminal liability to it? Is that... I wouldn't go so far as saying it's fraudulent, it, perhaps misleading. Um, permitted under the current legislation and under C-27 because although the, it's going to maintain the status quo of the same vague consent and that's not going to improve privacy. And so here's a chance for you now to address that specific consent clause. Um, I would say if you're not entering in with kind of full understanding, you can't consent. And I would say that if you're uh, downloading an app for a certain use and your use of that app is then sold to third parties that you don't know about um, and the real purpose of the act. And I, and I, I referenced Cambridge Analytica. You know, they had a, your, your life and data. I can't remember what the exact name of the app was where they scraped all this information. I would say it's fraud. You don't have to say that. But I would say it's a fraudulent kind of engagement of the consumer. Um, but it, as it relates to consent, again, if you could just maybe provide with specificity the types of explicit consent that you would like to see so that, so that people who uh, engage with these platforms would have like full prior knowledge to what it is they're engaging in. 
Okay, there's two things that you're, you're talking about here, I think. One is the companies, the organizations that are supposed to obtain our informed consent at the time of or prior to collecting our personal information, they acknowledge, as does Mark Zuckerberg, as he did before Congress, that few people read these privacy policies, which to me says they are collecting our personal information knowingly that w nobody reads the privacy policy, therefore it is not informed consent. So they are in violation of our privacy legislation and GDPR and others. What to do about it? Turn it around. Stop l allowing the organizations to be in control. Turn it around so that we each have the ability to... Um, Opt in Inter rather than opt out? No, not, more than just opt in, opt out. Interrogate the company. Make it so that there is an index of companies uh, do, so that consumers can go and see, did your company, uh, how do you comply with the legislation? If your company does in a way that is more, greater, better than yours, the consumer can make a choice. I allow my information to be used by your company for a certain purpose, I get a receipt. There is a record of it that I am in control of, Interesting. not the company. I appreciate that. You know, I think in the last study you were here, it was about um, you know, surveillance on, on phones, I believe, with the RCMP some time back. Spyware. Yeah, and, you know, here we are, right? Like, in a lot of ways, whether it's governments using these, these uh, devices or corporations using these kind of um, on-device applications, it's, it's spyware. Would you agree with that assessment that social media uh, apps are a form of spyware? Absolutely. Would you care to expand on that? Very quickly. <laughs> I have a challenge with that sometimes. There's a lot, as I said, to discuss. Okay. Um, the, uh, the, we're, the, we're, the, the granularity yeah. of the information they collect about us, usually without us knowing about it, they can use for their own purposes, whether it is the, uh, the ride-sharing app that we use that records the precise geolocation and the time of day, and who is that given to? And what assumptions can be drawn from that or any other information? It is effectively spying on us. I agree. Thank you, Ms. Polsky. Uh, Mr. Gould, for cinq minutes. Uh, on va Mr. Gould, five minutes. We're beginning the second round. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, witness. The statements we've heard from you and from other witnesses before you are concerning because we have become like goods as human beings. These companies have used our profiles, what we buy. They have assigned a profile to each individual and those profiles are sold to people. I have the impression that for our generation and for all those who use social media right now, it's too late. I am a happy granddad of about six, seven grandkids. They're still too young to use social media. Should we be working hard to protect that generation? Because I feel it's too late for us. Protecting the next generation, absolutely. But we're all fighting against well-funded big tech that insists that everybody wants this because nobody uh, understands it well. A few people understand it well enough to object uh, to what it is doing and doing to us. But things have changed very quickly. I think it was in 2004 when a minister of the Canadian government uh, was on the hot seat because it had been discovered by the media that the government was collecting 2,000 bits of information about each of the 33.4, I think, million Canadians when there was some 31 million Canadians. And people reacted quickly and vocally and then the minister said, never mind, we've given the information back, electronic data, how you do that, I don't know. And they apparently disbanded it. The sh that very quickly changed to now we have, instead of I deal with one government office or department or another, now I deal with government and the government says it owns my information. The, the pu public policy, the whole concept has shifted 
we have to, and I, I dare say the lawmakers have to, if, if there's a genuine interest in preserving, protecting children, privacy, and future generations, there needs to be some serious thought given to actually doing that. Uh, studies are wonderful, but action has to be taken very quickly. This quest for information about individuals, is this a violation of our individual freedoms? I've lost it. This quest for information from all individuals, is this a violation of our individual freedoms? Individual freedom. Absolutely, because it's too easy uh, for any organization to use the information that has been amassed about us to sway our views, to sway views of public policy, government, legislators, teachers, institutions. It's absolutely a threat to democracy and civil liberties, human rights. Uh, with artificial intelligence is going to make it even worse unless there is effective, strong regulation to protect individuals, not just to foster commerce. If compliance is an issue, why, and I appreciate the reverse onus, I, I agree, but why like this, the, this kind of rating mechanism that you've imagined instead of just like hard regulation and hard compliance that would have some kind of teeth in, in, in and around, you know, culpability of fines that meet kind of a, a disincentive or worse, uh, you know, criminal culpability. Go at it with both prongs so that the organizations have to comply. Think of it as uh, what Ralph Nader did long ago with the auto industry. It, some people called it public shaming. If you don't know how an organization is complying, whether they're complying, to what extent they're complying, you're in the dark. I would agree. Make it so that they have to publicly fess up. And um, you, you'd mentioned Bill C-27, and I do appreciate that. You'd mentioned that it's the status quo. It's just, you know, basically uh, making them use plain English, but still putting the onus on the on the person rather than in the corporation. So will more legislation be needed to properly regulate social media platforms, in your opinion? I think there's an awful lot of laws already on our books that address the problems that we see, the societal problems, the human nature problems that we see online and in social media. I don't know that having more laws, certainly not more bad laws, is going to improve anything. So no, look at what we already have, enforce that. Um, so you think that we, what we have is sufficient? If it was, if the people uh, in, in position to, uh, to enforce had the authority to enforce the laws, yes. It's now we have people who have the responsibility but not enough authority or funding. Okay, so to be clear, it's your opinion that by increasing the authority for oversight over these platforms with teeth that included a reverse onus on the corporation as well as regulation and or public shaming, that would be your recommendation to kind of uh, provide a, a better oversight for social media platforms? Yes, but I would challenge you on, on your reference that it's a reverse onus on the corporation. No, it's an obligation that they already face under legislation. I should say comply. reverse the onus because reverse. presently yes, the, the status you. quo is that the onus is on the person uh, that could not possibly consent or be informed about where their data goes. And you're suggesting, quite rightly, I would add, in my opinion, that that be placed on the people who create the algorithms, broker the information, and ultimately profit from it. Monetize our information. That's right. They should be the ones to prove that what they are foisting upon an unaware, unsuspecting public is safe, is Thank not you. going to undermine privacy, security, and national security. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Polsky, for appearing before the committee today. That concludes our second round of questioning. And uh, I'd like to thank you for the information that you've provided on behalf of Canadians, your work as well. So thank you.